Hey class, and welcome to Module 1, Lecture 1, here in the book of Ephesians. Open up your notes. You should have both a Word and PDF document, and follow along with the fill-ins uh, that we provide here in this class. We'll cover Chapter 1, the entire chapter, in this module, and we'll close with a quiz, so listen carefully and be ready as it will count towards your final grade. Let's jump right into Roman numeral one. The title of this book is very simply the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. The author, Roman numeral one, is the Apostle Paul. Well, how do we know? Verse number one says in the text, very simply, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And we take the Bible as at its word. John Phillips uh, points out there that the name Paul at the head of this letter commanded immediate attention. Paul's name had power in Ephesus. He had won large numbers of people there to Christ. And as he reminded the Corinthians, a person might have 10,000 teachers in Christ, but he does not have many fathers. So a letter from the one who led them to Christ would always be cherished. Well, when was this book written? Let's look at the date and the setting of this book. It's 60 or 61 AD, around there. And we know that it was during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. That's a fill-in to put in, the first Roman imprisonment. In Ephesians, he references this. In Ephesians 3, verse 1, he talks about that imprisonment. He refers to himself as a prisoner of the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 1, and in chapter 6, verse 20, again, he references his imprisonment. As Paul was imprisoned in his own house in Rome, uh, he was free to receive visitors at this time. It was during this time that he wrote the book of Ephesians. We know that this letter was carried... Ephesians 6, verse 21 tells us it was carried by uh, Tychicus. So that's many ways to look at that name, but uh, some say Tychicus or Tychicus, but uh, this was the one that carried the letter. Letter B tells us that while the letter was dictated to the saints at Ephesus, there's evidence that this could have been circulated. We do know that it was intended to be circulated ultimately among uh, the churches and uh, the church today, but they are originally in Asia Minor. And we do know that it's God's inspired, inerrant word revealed and relevant for us today. Roman numeral four tells us the theme. So what's the theme of this tremendous book? And it's this, very simply as well, the believer's riches in Christ. Make sure you know that. You will see that again because this book is all about our riches in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some key verses, Roman numeral six. And we heard this in our intro, Ephesians 1, verse 3, and chapter 1, verse 10. And go ahead and start memorizing those because I want you to know these two verses and the overall uh, theme of the book. The overall outline of the book we also covered in our introduction. But let's uh, look at it just briefly again as we see uh, there at the start, the first three chapters, the wealth of the believer moving into the walk and closing with the warfare of the believer. But let's jump into what we're looking at uh, in this lecture with some background and uh, context of the book. And perhaps especially for those who just took the book of Acts, thank you uh, for taking this class as well. And if you completed the book of Acts, we summarized briefly and provided notes for the second and third missionary journeys, but did not go into a lot of detail. But much of his third missionary journey was there in Ephesus. So let's look at this. According to Acts 18, the Apostle Paul entered Ephesus on his second missionary journey. Ephesus was a city that we know was steeped in idolatry and immorality. The temple to the goddess Diana, which happened to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This temple was a world center for wickedness where her worship was guarded jealously. We know that by what happened in Acts chapter 19, verse 23, as they began to cry, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Well, there on a second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul was only there for a short time as he journeyed to Jerusalem for a feast. 
We know that he left Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus to prepare the people for his return and when he would preach the gospel. Well, letter B in Acts chapter 19 and 20, Paul returns to Ephesus on his third missionary journey and he remains there for three years. So just think of it like this way. The third missionary journey, he was there for three years. Acts chapter 20 and verse 31 tell us about that. Letter one, or number one, he began his ministry in the Jewish synagogue, as was his pattern to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When they rejected his message, as often happened, he moves on to the Gentiles, and he moved into the school of a teacher named Tyrannus. In Acts chapter 19, verse 9, He's there preaching, and he taught there for about two years. Number, letter two, number two, his ministry had a tremendous effect on the city. You know that those that were practicing witchcraft turned to Christ, and they burned their magic books. And many people were one to the worship of the true God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophets of the silversmiths who sold the shrines of Diana were greatly uh, undermined in their profiting and they were inspired to incite a riot. Number three, when the riot ceased, Paul was sent away. In Acts chapter 20, we see Paul on a beach at a nearby city named Miletus. And when he, he invited the Ephesian elders, and Paul kneels down. It's a, quite a moving scene. It's important to see the context of this. He kneels and the Ephesian elders are weeping on his neck. Just picture that, sorrowing that they would see him no more. So with that in mind, can you imagine the excitement as the Ephesian elders that were weeping at his neck and the people there at Ephesus received an epistle taken from Tychicus by Paul addressed to them. It had been 10 years, remember that, 10 years since they had seen him. It's important to get that context and understanding. Well, let's jump in right into the book itself. The address and greeting. Well, Paul goes on to say, to the saints, verse number one, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. John Phillips notes in his commentary, and that is our required textbook for this class. And by the way, you should be reading through that book. I want you to have it. Uh, carry it with you. You will use it again as you uh, teach and preach through this book. It's a tremendous resource, really everything that John Phillips writes about Ephesians and Philippians. You get uh, a bonus of Philippians as well as you have Ephesians. But John Phillips writes this, the word grace, now get this because grace is an important theme here in the book of Ephesians. The word grace occurs a dozen times in this letter. Twelve times you'll find the book, the word grace. Paul customarily replaced the regular Greek salutation, rejoice. So typically the Greeks would say rejoice, chiare, with the phonetically similar word grace, charis. Now I like that word. My daughter, one of my daughters is named charis and we, smel uh, we, we spelled it there uh, phonetically as well. The regular Jewish salutation was peace, shalom. So here's what he's doing. He's joining right at the beginning of the letter the Jews and Gentiles in a bond of love in his greetings. But he did more. Here's what John Phillips goes on to say. He, he customarily lifted the salutation even higher. This grace and peace came from God our Father, indicating that the Jews and Gentiles in the church are members of a common family, children of the same Father. And then Paul added, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, equating the Lord Jesus to the Father. Philip says, thus Paul emphasized the deity, deity of Christ. Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent with the Father. The greeting comes from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace is elevated from a marketplace salutation to a benediction and affirmation of faith. Wow, that's tremendous. Right from the start of Ephesians. It's going to be a great book. Let's continue with the exposition here, the first three verses, where we discover the believer and his blessings. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, 1 through 3, 
uh, speaks of this. And Paul uses the term right from the beginning. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He uses the term blessed, eulogetas, referring to God. Blessed be. It's a word of praise. Now, the same root word is used with referring to what God has done for us. So he says, blessed be, eulogetas, God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, who hath blessed us, eulogia, eulogia. He makes the point. Blessed be God. That's first and foremost. But he connects it to the truth that while we are blessing God, we know this, we have been blessed by God. Ephesians 1 verse 3, let's look at this. It introduces us to the Christian's riches in Christ. It goes on and says, do you notice this? With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice as you're looking at the outline here, letter A, the source. We're told that it's God the Father who has made us rich. The scope. We have all spiritual blessings. Then letter C, the sphere in heavenly places. I like what Warren Wiersbe had to say about this. The phrase in Christ Jesus. Now get this as well. A lot of numbers here, okay? But the phrase in Christ Jesus is used 27 times in this letter. Some have said the Ephesians is the epistle of inness because the in Christ Jesus is used so much here. It describes, he goes on to say, the spiritual position of the believer. He is identified with Christ. He is in Christ and therefore is able to draw on the wealth of Christ for his own daily living. That's tremendous. The rest of chapter 1 will go through the blessings from God the Father. Blessings from God the Son. Blessings from God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to walk through each of those in our next lecture. John Phillips closes this section by writing this. He says that Ephesians is the New Testament counterpart of the book of Joshua. Get that in your notes. Joshua, Old Testament, Ephesians, New Testament. Philip says, just as Israel's blessings were found in Canaan, so ours are found in the heavenlies. Just as the Israelites had to battle many enemies in Canaan in order to possess all that God had promised to them, so we have to battle Satan and his army in order to enter into all that is ours in heavenly places. Just as Israel's inheritance in Canaan was fiercely contested by the foe, so our inheritance in the heavenlies is also strongly contested. Just as Joshua led God's chosen people into victory, so Jesus leads us. If our blessings are in heavenly places, they are also in Christ. Satan and his evil host may haunt the heavenlies, but Christ has conquered them. The Israelites had only to trust and obey in order to enter into the blessings God had in store for them in Canaan. The Canaanites, despite their formidable appearance, were already defeated. That's a great foundational statement. Here's what Philip says as well. All Israel had to do was go forward in faith and obedience. And here's where he draws it home. I love how this is our textbook because this is helpful. The same is true for us. The heavenlies are occupied by the foe and there can be no blessings without battles, but the foe is already defeated. Christ, our heavenly Joshua, leads us into victory and into the actual possession of all that has been promised to us in Him. What a tremendous statement. And let me just share this. This past year, at our church, the Lord led me to preach through Joshua verse by verse and then the book of Ephesians verse by verse. Our theme this year was I will dwell. God's promise, our possession. And it's just a thrill uh, for me to teach through this and walk through it and again, lay hold of that promise of dwelling in His promises and possessions. Well, I'll see you in lecture two as we go a little deeper on everything that God has done for us and how He has blessed us. We'll see you there.